Welcome back everybody to your daily update on the state of the Malazan Empire. And yes, we're back with an actual update. I mean, I took something of a break yesterday. Um, things have not been easy overall, not just with the Malazan stuff, but life and shit. And I took the approach of a detox by intoxication, if that makes any sense. I don't know, I just went on a bender for a couple of days and... Um, now I'm sort of back with regular content, and unless something big happens, I will no longer address the entire Steven Erickson um, debacle. That just doesn't feel productive at this point anymore. I will happily um, talk with uh, beautifully bookish Bethany on the subject, because I feel dialogue is the only way to move forwards here, but more videos like just me um, explaining my point, that won't help anymore. I just want to apologize to Leanne. I fucked up the name badly because I'm an idiot. Also, I'm blind and my screen reader fucks up names even more. So that's the reasoning behind it. I could have gone to more trouble to actually double check, but I didn't because I was angry and I'm sorry for that. I'll try to not uh, do that anymore. Anyway. Let's get into the actual content, and that is me talking about Reaper's Gale some more. Cheers. So yeah, I um, read. Finally got to do some actual reading again. And uh, we're talking mostly about chapters 15 and 16 today. So it's going to be chapters 17 and 18 tomorrow. And then we go into the final book of Reaper Scale until the end of the week, I suspect. And if all goes well, on Saturday we'll talk about <clears throat> state-sponsored violence or um, torture or secret police and how it's depicted in different types of fantasy. And won't that be fun? Well, it won't, but, you know. Um, <laughs> so there's that. Um, until then... Yeah, that's sort of the roadmap. We'll see how all of that goes. I hope it goes well. Um, so the topics will remain, however, rather difficult. Um, uh, because, yeah, we're, we're still talking Malazan. And Malazan is not a happy world with happy things happening all the time. Um, so we're going to talk about stuff like racism and problematic pictures of masculinity in traditional societies. And um, the stupidity and arrogance of imperialism and stuff like that. Because, you know, that's the kind of stuff that's happening. So I first want to address something that was sort of already mentioned before, but probably not well articulated on my part. And that's the part about the Malazan army very much underestimating or overestimating or generally um, not getting the um, their expectations of their of their campaign in leather right because they as the invading power as the foreign power with very little intelligence assumed a whole lot of things about how a how the society what the society would be like that they would arrive at. Now, that comes from their background as an imperial power, which assumes uh, that uh, subjugated countries, subjugated um, uh, cultures will fight back, uh, will fight against their um, military um, uh, conquerors most of the time. Now, this does that always work? It's interesting to look at that because... There's, a, there's an inbuilt arrogance, because it's exactly the thing that Malazan military or um, co colonial politics tried to avoid, right? We, we've, we've talked about that in Garden of the Moon. The idea of bringing a... like, or fighting corruption, of bringing, like, a certain level of wealth to the uh, colonized populations by establishing better trade options, a certain bureaucracy, local bureaucracy that um, empowers the lower classes towards um, the older, like, upper classes and nobility. All these things that the Malazan Empire in 
like optimal circumstances, that is obviously, um, brings with a military conquest or tries to implement during a military conquest, like on Genebakis with Pale, we see it's sort of with Pale there, um, or tried to probably also tried to bring to seven cities where it didn't work, um, um, would minimize that kind of thing. But in the end, there's like, the takeaway there, I feel, is that the uh, the Fourteenth Army, and we're talking about here, Tavor's army has just come from like quelling a rebellion that has sprung up. So that has tainted up to a point. Um, they're uh, tainted their expectations of what to expect, which is a rebelling populace. <laughs> tainted it into that way, instead of the other way that say, leaving towards Leather after Gardens of the Moon, or maybe even after Memories of Ice, would have, like, brought them to. So that's that's a first way to look at it and see how our recent experiences always tain, tend to taint our assumptions, in a way. Which, you know, like, bias is probably a better word than taint, because it's not negative, per se. Per se. It might just be, but... It, not always. So there, there's that aspect. But then the other thing is that the Malazans come from a background where they have always been the more sophisticated power, the more, whether it's more sophisticated in military technology or in cultural technologies and cultural um, innovations and stuff like that. They have always been the more sophisticated ones. And they thus assume that you have a less sophisticated, newly subjugated country um, with a smaller but more culturally and military more advanced, sophisticated um, power subjugating them. Like the situation they usually create when they come somewhere and take over a place. And that case obviously does produce, um, in a way... A, it, it does produce or tend to produce uh, the idea of a um, unhappy populace, um, an unhappy um, subjugated population plotting rebellions, uh, acts of sabotage and all of that. Um, the third then interesting question is like, why would you assume that the Lethary, if they exist, um, if if they are unhappy with their Edur overlords, why would you assume that they would be happy with another foreign power coming in there and helping? And like, why would you believe them that they would leave afterwards and not just, you know, take over? And it's like, why would you, why would you exchange the overlords that you know and have sort of come to an arrangement with? Why would you willingly exchange those for overlords um, that you don't know about? Now, obviously, that kind of works worked at least in part within their the Malazan flu, uh, sphere of influence, like on Janabakis, maybe on Seven Cities. I don't know. Um, well, Quantali is probably, uh, yeah, but you know, it worked there where people knew about the Malazan Empire and what Malazan occupation would bring or not bring. Um, but the Lethary, they don't know the Malazans. They have never heard about the Malazans. So why would they make that assumption? It's like, in it's basically both both expectations that the Malazans have. The one being that Malazan military tactics and uh, Malazan um, administrative um, tactics and skills would win the populace over, as they did on Genebakis with places like Pale, or probably did with places like Pale. I mean, we don't have much information of what happened afterwards because we don't go back to that place in the Malazan Book of the Fallen. Um, yeah, by, by that, um, why if to expect that Malazan successes will bring the populace on their side because people expect the Malazan overlords to be fairer overlords than, say, the Tist Edur overlords. And then the other mis misapprehension is to expect that why would they the Lethary be unhappy with the with their Edur overlords? 
And those are clashing assumptions. And so it's very interesting to wonder why, um, it's very interesting to speculate why someone as good a tactician and someone as ruthless when it seems to come to um, self-examination as Tavora would make that that blunder in a way, that arrogant blunder. But maybe it just goes to show that it's very, very difficult to um, actually leave your, you know, your cultural assumptions and backgrounds behind, which is kind of the thing there. Because, it's, yeah, the Lethary are happy with the, with the, the small group of um, um, Edur because they run circles around them. And it works because the Lethary were the culturally more, more sophisticated is probably in a way. Also, their, their society has had like much more, much more inertia and much more powers of resistance than the smaller Edur uh, elite, that minority that actually conquered um, the, the country. So I just felt it interesting to look at that because it kind of shows us what kind of assumptions we make and uh, what, how our prejudices of our upbringing, of our recent experiences, how they can lead to problematic decisions, especially once we make uh, decisions about um, unknown areas or places that we don't know about, which, you know, means either try to get more information, um, if you can, or try to be as careful and make as little assumptions as you can in a way. But yeah, that's sort of a reprise from, uh, not reprise, but a reprieve from, not, not wrong word, but you know, it's I'm sort of me coming back to stuff that I should have said in my last video, but you know, I wasn't the most happy person back then. <laughs> um, anyway, now let's look at the next bit there. And I found the conversation. Um, first of all, I found the conversation with... Um, Uruf Sengar and Tomad Sengar and their interactions or not exactly working out interactions with um with Rulat Sengar and that that plot line found I found that one very interesting because it shows something that is realistic and also very sad about us as people and that is racism and arrogance <clears throat> and the way it is examined is even more problematic, I feel, because what we have in that discussion with Uruth and Tomat is like, Tomat is very much angry at um, the Lethary and how the Lethary have influence over Rulat, or how could Rulat even dare to let a um, Lethary um, woman, there's... we. As I said, that we'll also need to talk about um, the gender roles here a bit for a second. Uh, yeah, how could he let someone that close? No one can trust the lethary. There's a clear um, anti-lethary racism within Malazan, uh, within Malazan. <laughs> They're probably two, but mostly within um, Tist Edur thinking that has always been there. That's the interesting situation there because what we see is like even at the beginning of the entire story in, in Midnight Tides, the Edur, while sort of fearing the Lethary, also think of them as less than themselves. Their society is very elitist. Their, their thinking is very elitist about them being the best people in the world and labeling the, 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 the Lethary as weak, as not to be trusted, and a lot of other problematic things things. Now, the idea there is that those are prejudices. Um, some of them may have been borne out by interactions before. It's how, usually how some prejudices um, start out. Um, the interesting thing is that their military victory, their sort of unexpected military victory over the um, Lether Empire, only served to actually reinforce those stereotypes and those um, prejudices. They still think of the Lethary as being um, treacherous, um, greedy, and not to be trusted, and weaker 
than themselves because obviously they won military, so the Lethari must be weaker. And that coupled with the fact that their like societal norms are fundamentally different. They, their entire way of thinking is entirely different because they come from a non-capitalist society. And we need to keep this in mind. That Lethary is very much, uh, Lethras is very much about capitalism and about the issues with the system capitalism. And there are some, uh, I'm not going to preach here about that kind of thing. This is more about having a system where um, the idea of commerce is an entirely different one. Um, you know, your your idea of different types of capital once again comes into being here, your Bourdieu, if you want, in a way. And that is a huge that is a huge problem because that that idea of not actually realizing that combined with a society that is very traditional, um, has very clear roles of um, uh, gender roles, very clear. I'm not saying, uh, you know, it just has like very clear traditions and gender roles. That doesn't mean that there is a huge gender imbalance. That's not exactly what I'm finding here. It's more about these um, very clear defined roles that you have in such like a warrior, um, semi-nomadic warrior society as the just Edward there, right? They... There are clear um, male virtues and aspects, and there's clear there are clear female um, aspects like um, um, virtues and um, qualities is I guess a better word because it's less morally loaded than virtue is, and it is that point that we then can see where. Um, Uruth has that conflict with Tom and Sengar because they have come up against a situation where those gender roles are much more fluid in a way. <laughs> There's a lot of very powerful women in Letheras that um, do um, stuff that your Tist Edor woman would probably not do. And the fact that, and there is, like, the next big thing there will be um, that um, level of homophobia um, leveled against Triban Ganol. <laughs> See, that's that's where we kind of come to that problem with prejudices and stuff like that, is that um, Tomad Sengar not being able to reach his son is, for Uruth Sengar, the idea of him being emasculated, the, 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 the idea that this actually is an attack on his masculinity and his male qualities or values or whatever, that is a, that is a problem because it then forces Tomat Sengar to once again think in those categories that he has already been thinking about, uh, thinking in all the time that will not help him in this situation. It certainly doesn't help that Uruth is very much um, um, has shows clear homophobia against Triban Gnoll, who seems to be um, uh, homosexual. That topic hasn't been explored much so far in the book. That's why I'm not going to talk about it in detail or in the depiction, because that's not the point. The point is that in that society that a very traditional, apparently homophobic society. The the fact that the um, that yeah the sexual preferences of Chancellor Triban Ganol make him less of a general person in her in her view, letting her to underestimate him, just as Tomat Sengar. Although Tomat Sengar seems to have. Um, realize that he's outmatched by the Chancellor, but being told that it's unmanly to be outmatched by that uh, by that Chancellor because of th those all that stuff is completely irrelevant to the problem they face uh, because they're so caught up in these in these ways of thinking, ways they were brought up with, ways they were um, yeah 
it it's very it's almost impossible for them to actually leave those ways of thinking behind it's it's an act it's an active decision to do that every day for like all of us humans because we all grow up with a ton of prejudices and to recognize those and not fall back into them is immensely difficult it's like something that i guess we all struggle with it's not that you decide to no longer be a certain way no, you do that every single day, and sometimes we fail at it. But and obviously, it's easier to fail at these things in situations of stress. So there is there is understanding for why they are acting the way they are, but also there is clear like compassion from uh, f at least for me from the outside because they can't. I I, I know that it's extremely difficult to, for them to overcome that, and the fact that they can't adds like depth to the tragedy here. It's not just that they're stupid or anything no they're anything but stupid they may be um rather conservative but um that's that's not the same as saying stupid they that makes it just more hard uh, even harder for them to actually overcome these um these ways of thinking and Tomat Sengar not being able to um, actually just go in there, kill everybody and talk to his son is not a sign of cowardice. It's, it's a sign of um, him realizing that he can't do that and then being put down for it by an attack on his identity, on his self-image, on his self-worth, which will not help. And yeah, it, it results in him just being angry, which, you know, doesn't bring us anywhere and then they end up where they end up so there's there's that and i feel that's once once again it's one of those small images like one is small conversations not a big thing that still shows problems on a much larger scale um another thing that i felt is interesting it's because this time around we actually have that situation where the errand is examining Rula Sengar sitting there on the tr on the throne um, the way he's presented and Erickson makes it really clear that um, that Rulad Sengar is very much a symbol for Lethary society in all the combination of being the, this ravaged physical husk underneath underneath the, the the armor of gold or it's clad in gold and he has the sword it's, it's a long part where he ruminates on that and realized how symbolic all of that is that is cool and i really enjoyed that because it's a symbol that has been apparent for a while right we, we kind of realize that all the time i feel however that the more important significance in there the sad significance is one that goes back to um to Midnight Tides. And that is, Rulat Sengar became that person before starting the attack on Letheras. So him being the symbol for Lether, or for Lethery culture or whatever, which he undoubtedly is, is not the, not the lesson here. It's him having to become that before being able to actually take over Letheras. And that's that's one of those things where we realize that, yeah, this is sort of actually worked out and planned over several books. And that's, you know, just a small thing, but I felt it was interesting to look at that. And uh, yes, um, just appreciate it for a moment. Um, another thing that I felt was interesting was that conversation with Karsa, Orlong, and Samar Dev that, but more so even um, Karsa, Orlong's um, inner monologue or thinking um, after she left and his, the gender roles that he still has in his brain where he's like, you know, that the his relationship with Summer Dev um, um, is extremely tricky because he cannot really, um, you know, comprehend anything or take things that she says at face value and so forth. And that, that is something that, high, you know, it's we're at this point in Carcer's existence 
and Carson's relationship with the world in general or journey to, towards self-awareness where he realizes that problem but he's still not able to actually overcome it because he re he realizes that at this point his only option to deal with these mental struggles that he has which are struggles of identity obviously as well um, to overcome those his his only answer at this point is violence and this is this is interesting because we have realized at this point that Carso Orlong is far from a very from a simple character. He may be simple. He's rather complex, and he's also not he's not stupid. He's not he's he's a very intelligent intelligent person who is able to to rationalize a lot of things. He often deliberately chooses not to. But that's more of the point here. It's like he is at that point where he goes through the motions or the learned things that he like the the responses that he knows which is i don't understand something i get violent which you know is something that we see mirrored in the smaller on the smaller level in like small like moments before where it's like where a lethary guard or thug decides that you know it has this highly problematic connection between violence and sexuality and we see that in a way with Carsa Orlong in the other as well, but on a larger scale and more um, more reflection going on there. It's, it's still not past that, but it's still there is reflection going on there, which is a good thing. I just felt it interesting to actually note that bit. All right. So what else? Um, not much really that I feel comfortable talking about. There is that situation with, um, Baniscar, which is still, you know, the point that he is apparently coming back towards, um, being high priestess of Drek. <laughs> I feel there's more in there that I want to talk about in the future um, because we, we will learn more about the relationship between gods and their worshippers. And it's interesting to parallel the way the relationship between Drek and Baniskar on the one hand and the relationship between the Errant and Feather Witch on the other one because they are sort of happening like in in they they sort of mirror themselves uh, the, uh, itself themselves they mirror themselves they because on the one hand it's the goddess forcefully um requiring a new high priest um uh like reclaiming him by force and on the other hand it's the high priest is forcefully reclaiming a god and I felt that very, very interesting as well. I just don't know how to actually talk about it in more detail. So I'll, I'll keep that for later, as well as um, the whole um, Red Mask um, storyline. I mean, Cool Archery by our good buddy um, Tok. Those, those arrows seem to be really, really powerful. And we know where those arrows are from, because those are the ones that Onos Tulan made for him. So they apparently have a lot of power, and that's, you know, that's a thing. Um, then there is obviously the genocide uh, of the Tist Andy in Blue Rose, in that, in that uh, monastery. And that's something I also don't feel comfortable talking about today. I'm not quite sure if I have like processed all that's going on there because I'm I'm slow sometimes, right? And that's um There is a lesson on fascism there though with Letter Annect. Um that's something that I feel we can, you know, come back to especially if we tie it back to some of the things that um What's his name? Um, Silchas Ruin said to Bryce Bedict when they were talking in in that memory world thing, other war or even other time, because I'm not quite sure how that worked out. But they had this conversation on deadly lethary society, and I feel those two um, those two things come back to each other and are 
very interesting on that idea of how how capitalism and a sort of fascism go very well together in specific areas. And that's something we need to talk about. Maybe when we talk more about uh, Karas and Victor at some point, I guess. So, I mean, that's sort of what I feel like talking about today. I hope you took something out of this. Um, I'm really trying to let that unfortunate uh, events of last week go past. Um, I still hope that a lot of those people of you who actually decided to subscribe because of it or during it will stay. Welcome to all of you <laughs> new people. I really, really appreciate that. Let me know what you think in the comments and um, I'll be back tomorrow with more um, Reaper scale stuff. Until then, cheers.